So welcome to this next Teach Happy vlog, and I'm delighted that our guest today is Bruce Daisley. Bruce was previously European Vice President for Twitter. He's the host of the UK's number one business podcast, Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat. His work has been cited in The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, and The Harvard Business Review, as well as many other uh, papers uh, and uh, journals. His first book, The Joy of Work, was a Sunday, Sunday Times bestseller, and his latest book, Fortitude, which I ha have been reading recently, um, was named the best business book of the year in 2022 by the Financial Times. So welcome, Bruce. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm so glad that you're able to, to, to make this kind of interview because I read this um, book, uh, I think I started it um, just before Christmas. Yeah, and it was my Christmas book that I was kind of dipping into uh, in between kind of all the Christmas traditions and everything. And it's it's obviously not a book for teaching and education, but I always, every book I read is always through a kind of education and teaching lens. And I think this has a lot that teachers and school leaders can kind of uh, learn from. And I think one of the most important things is, you know, this concept of resilience, which is, I think, a really big topic in schools. Um, in fact, you even cite a survey from 2021 uh, of British school teachers where they revealed that resilience is the number one skill they most wanted to develop in their students. Um, but interestingly, that the first part of your book is called Decoding the Myths of Resilience. So my first question is, why is our common understanding of resilience perhaps wrong? Yeah, and, and look, you know, I think teachers are sort of top of mind in terms of who I who I think about as potential audiences for this, even though it's sort of far more general book, because like you say, you know, resilience, growth mindset, grit, these are the the messages that are really heavily pushed to schools and, and schools are made to feel like they, they need to be considering them. The the interesting thing about resilience is that um for me it's a bit like nuclear fusion in the sense that this might be a bad metaphor but i was just thinking about it the other day in the sense that we know nuclear fusion exists right because the sun uh gives us pretty vivid evidence that nuclear fusion can power um j just remarkably um but we we struggle to replicate it and and resilience is a bit like that in the sense that we know it exists we see performance that's resilient I always think of the people in Ukraine or like, you know, you witness people in natural disasters, the survivors of the, the Pakistan floods. And you think, well, we've got this resilience all around when we, we look for it. But when you try and reproduce it, we really struggle. And by that, I mean, um, you see interesting evidence of school resilient programs. And look, we witnessed actually that when academics have tried to study these and see if they work, they struggle to get any uplift or actually the US military is probably the best example. The US military used a pretty similar program to the sort of initiative that might be implemented in schools. They spent about a billion dollars trying to train combat soldiers to be more resilient. And actually the, the evidence when people went and checked it, they said it had zero impact. And that's the interesting thing. We, we might do these resilience programs. We might set about trying to create more resilient kids, but when people have gone and checked, did it have any impact? The research, the evidence is it didn't have an impact. And so you're in this weird thing then that, you know, you know, resilience is all around you. When you try and create resilience, it doesn't seem to be making more resilient kids. What's going wrong? And fundamentally, the reason why I sort of talk about the myth of resilience is that the idea that we can somehow summon this individual trait in people, this we can put the people in individuals in this you know, created state is a total illusion. Resilience is the strength we draw from each other. And mm. as soon as you sort of recognize that, I think, then you go back to all the cases where you do see resilience. You go, oh, right, of course it is. It's people feeling emboldened by the people around them, feeling connected, supported by a network around them. And I'll give you one really, really compelling piece of evidence on it. These, um, something that's of relevance to teachers and, and and something I sort of found myself completely immersed in because I used to work in social media and these uh, probably the world's leading expert on teenage mental well-being is a woman called Jean Twenge. She studies um, 
teenagers you know she, she wrote an article in the atlantic magazine an american magazine called how smartphones destroy the generation so you know you get a clue of where she's going yeah. from from the headline but she found something really interesting she said like if you're going to understand this teenagers and there's really interesting difference actually between american education and british ed education here but um t teenagers she said have gone from being generation we they're all surrounded with their friends. They spend time in each other's bedroom. They're, they're immersed in each other's lives to Generation Me, where their main interactions with each other are characterized by being through their phones, through being through messaging apps. Really interesting. She says the American lunch room in schools now, like the dining room, mm -hmm. um, she says it's silent now. Now, I think in most British schools, um, you, you're not able to, I don't know, I've, I've witnessed varying approaches, but a lot of schools sort of don't allow you to just sit on your phone all, all lunchtime. But um, it's it, an interesting sort of perspective. But she yeah. says that mobile phones have characterised it. But the, the reason why I mention it is during the pandemic, she found this really interesting thing that I think it gives you a real big pointer of where resilience comes from. So she was expecting, like everyone, pandemic is a mental health disaster because we've witnessed so much stuff pandemic went on so long that we we witnessed a lot of alarming statistics but she started looking at data just for the first three months she remember the first three months of the pandemic we were sort of all you know we're cooking evening meals we were we were watching tea time briefings on tvs like in the, the the world had a very we were doing jigsaw puzzles hard even now to to believe that that took place but um we, we were sort of immersed in this different world she said teenagers who started having an evening meal with their families maybe for the first time ever midweek um their resilience went up and their depression went down why? Because, you know, they're sitting down with their siblings, they're having a conversation with their carers, their mums, their dads, their stepdads, whatever. Um, they were in the, this situation where feeling connected to other people in a real um, sort of tangible way lifted their resilience. And I think, you know, that gives you a real key pointer. If you start thinking of resilience as the strength we draw from each other, it forces mm. you to reframe, I think, some of the ways that we might we might seek seek it out. Yeah. And so then from a kind of teaching school perspective, like maybe this notion of directly teaching resilient skills might be a, a misnomer, but actually schools potentially could be a great source of resilience because of that social, you know, we can be part of a team in this class and, and we've got, we're part of a community and a support network here. So maybe it's more of a, an oblique, you know, bolstering of resilience through being connected to your classmates, your teachers, your support staff, etc. Exactly that. And there's really lovely evidence to back up some of the stuff that schools have done for generations, you know, outward bound trips, trips, you know, where we've we sort of put people together and get the kids together and get them to deal with situations with their own initiative. And there's really lovely evidence. I, I cite a, a couple of examples from um, studies in New Zealand, which, which say actually the stuff that teachers have done for generations is incredibly effective at achieving this. Now, I'm sure any teacher involved in those things would know how effective they are for producing a bit more agency, a bit more autonomy in kids. <laughs>